Hello, buenos dias. Thank you for inviting me to be with you. I wish I could have been with you in person. Inshallah, ojalá, we'll be able to meet one day in person again soon. I particularly want to thank Miguel Angel Vargas, who invited me, who's been patient uh, while I try to figure out how to make this video, and who has translated this presentation with hardly any time to prepare. Gracias, Miguel, for all that you do and for being such an amazing brother. And I also want to apologize porque estoy un poco resfriada. And so you might hear a little bit of nasal in my nose as, as I speak. Today, I want to talk about encampment as archive, um, as disruption, as future, and as love. And this is part of a larger project that I'm working on, on encampment, its possibilities, its histories, its violence, and its future. And I want to think about, and I want to think together about the making and the unmaking of the archive. What are our archives? And what are the possibilities for disruption, for undoing? for decolonizing the archive. For me, this means an engagement uh, with knowledge production at the margins, through intimacy, through gendered and racialized embodiment, and through a disruption of the nation state and the border. When I speak about encampment, I'm talking about Romani existence on the margins of Europe, on the margins of the Americas and beyond in the ways in which we have been relegated to the outside of the city, to the outside of power, to the outside of belonging. I'm also talking about the practices of homemaking, of world making, of future making, the possibilities of connection amongst Roma, amongst migrants, amongst marginalized people, and the ways in which we come together to make life, to make survival and to make resistance. Um, I guess a few notes before I begin. Uh, I'll be talking about the intimate histories of my family. And I'll be using Anglo-Romani, our Pogarichib, um, throughout. If I forget to translate, please just remind me afterwards and I'll, I'll help you with that. But in the meantime, I want to make a statement. Encampment marks Romani past, present, and future. It is at once a position, a positionality, and an embodiment. It's a sense of place, and it's a grounding. And for me, it's been a patrin, throughout a patron, however we want to say it, um, depending on which language you're speaking. Throughout my history, the kind of ways in which my family has engaged with survival, has lived through evictions um, and the denial of schooling, the denial of healthcare, uh, the denial of belonging has been through practices of the camp. And in this, what I mean, or what I, what I guess I wanna think about it as, is as an archive that is at once a refusal of the, a refusal of the nation state and its resistance as survival. It's polyvocality in knowledge production and love as method. It's archive, the archive of encampment, contains testimony and song, slavery and eviction, the smell of sweet grass and horses, the forge and the officia. Encampment as practice is theorized through cartographic, psychoanalytic, prognostic epistemics of palmography. On the one hand, which I can talk about in our discussion after, and survival on the other. References and dominant scholarly formations to things like nomadology, you know, Deleuze, cannot take in, cannot account for the forms of life to which they refer. And Lacan's mirror stage something is something that may continue as a practice of the oppressed, as a form of knowing that Daniel Baker shows us in his reflective pieces and in his reflective practice. In this way, I want to begin 
with an understanding and an understanding of the camp as the center of reflection, of knowledge, of knowledge production, and of being. The Romani camp is avant-garde, it's home. It has been a permanent grounding for me and for my family. It's been in Anglo-Romani, a Christiachin ten for everyone. The concentration camp, alternately. La Gran Revada, the mass imprisonment of our people, all forms of imprisonment and carcerality, containment of marginalization, were designated to destroy the Romani camp, designated to imprison and murder our people, even as they worked to reproduce the Romani camp as a genocidal practice. And that's why it's really important for me to think about what it means to reclaim sites of non-nation non state belonging, such as the camp, such as you know, the marginalized community that, that, we've, that we've come in, you know, that we've kind of come from that have, have raised us, right? right? Our people and our communities. They've brought us to where we were, where we are. And they've allowed us to survive, sometimes to thrive and to continue. And so I guess what I wanna think about is, you know, Agamben talks about the camp as the nomos of the, of the modern. The quote, space that is opened up when the state of exception begins to become the rule, end quote. At the same time, I really want to think about it as a specific formation marked by the particularities of Romani history and survival across centuries. At once a home and a practice of homemaking, the caravan, the encampment, the squat, the cave, the mahala, the shanty town. These are sites of certainly concentration, exclusion, and violence, right? They become, um, you know, at once, you know, just sites of, of non-belonging. But our methodology for understanding and for documenting these apparent contradictions and for charting the boundedness of community is through other forms of archive, through other forms of historiography, through testimony, through storytelling, through song, through dance, through work, and through other intergenerational forms of knowledge transmission. This transmission um, can be read ethnographically, certainly performatively, polyvocally, multisensorily, um, and imaginatively. But in the end, right, these are the archives that we hold on to, our sources of knowledge and our means of survival their history, their embodiment, their protest, and they ground us as formations of resistance, of belonging, and of tenacity. So in that way, you know, I'm, I don't know, and I'm, I'm turning my pages as we talk, I don't know how we understand the position of the archive and encampment. I think that we have to look at sites of generation of knowledge that have exceeded the kind of archive as the repository of sovereignty, as possibility for allowing us to think of other ways of being, of other ways of belonging, and of other ways of living together. If the archive is the repository of sovereignty, right, and that comes from um, in Bembe and it comes from Agamben, you know, we can talk about kind of who's theorizing that. It's also always the site of perpetrator knowledge. And that's key, right? The archive is not, is never about preserving, or at least the official archive is never about preserving our lost histories or our stories, right? It's always about kind of maintaining the narratives and the stories of the nation state. Sovereignty as practice has enacted its violence um, on its racialized, gendered, sexualized subjects. It's carefully curated knowledge and the knowledge it produces is a knowledge of dominance. So I guess the question is, right, can we look to some other forms of knowledge production, um, some other ways that can help us understand the composition of the archival grain, drawing from Spivak, who pushes us to read against it as a way to see differently or perhaps from Stoller, who asks us to look 
at its contours to better understand its formation. What is the relation, for example, between testimony and the perpetrator archive? Agamben sees them as oppositional because of their relationship to language, to the unsaid and the said, to the outside and the inside of Lang. I want to make the claim for testimony as knowledge practice, not as truth and not as the opposite of or in opposition to the archive. I just want to think about knowledge practice. Testimony, telling the stories of where we've come from, where we are, who we are, what our experiences are. What I've called in um, earlier work, um, living proof. Uh, is to the archive what encampment is to the state. Encampment as a counter-hegemonic practice, a formation that it is once contingent and dependent upon relation and on upon particular forms of belonging. Um, parallels testimony and its relation to knowledge, to speech, and to subjectivity through its formations around contingency, the ways in which it's provisional, just as encampment as practice is provisional. And Agamben frames it this way, quote, precisely because testimony is the relation between a possibility of speech and its taking place. It can exist only through a relation to the impossibility of speech. That is only as contingency, as the capacity of not to be, not to be. So in this way, right, testimony is archive. When we talk about, when we talk, when we tell stories, when we sing, when we, when we come together and celebrate our existence. Um, this is also testimony. And in this way, it opens up possibility for knowledge and for other ways of knowing, of being, and of creating relation. And I guess, I, you know, the reason I want to think about this um, is because of my own relation to, to the books that are around me, to the ways in which my coming into reading, right, and coming from a family where education was denied, my, my mother, her siblings, my grandparents, because of who they were, right? Um, so I've always had, you know, I love my books around me. Um, I have to have my books around me, but we didn't have books, right? I didn't have books growing up. What I had was the library. And when we think about the library as a kind of archive, as commons, and here I'm thinking about public libraries, right? The ones that are perhaps or not in neighborhoods. Um, they, there was one in my working class uh, town growing up and my, you know, it was something that was very central to me. But, you know, I think it's also that the archive itself and the library, as it were, the commons, is, is susceptible to encampment, to testimony as a response, a possibility of speech, a contestation and a refusal. I went to a small um, university, um, Williams College, I went to it for its archive, for its library. The library at Williams, when I visited before, before deciding you know, where to go to university, my mom and I went and it was inviting, um, particularly to me who I, I'd never been to a library outside of my local town library. And it had this, this university library had comfortable seating areas and books to explore. Because growing up, my mother and I would visit our local library at least twice a week, bringing back armfuls of books from each visit. We would read together, we'd share our books. And this is my mom who, you know, like I said, was, was not allowed to, to go to school by the local authorities after, I think she was something, like after her seventh year of schooling, they, they, they threw them out of the community. So it was really important to us, you know, this access to books and the access to the commons of, of books, right? To a, a book where you could take it out, read it and return it so other people could read. So we would visit that library at least twice a week, bringing back armfuls of books from each visit. 
we would read together. We'd share our books with my auntie. And then we'd return again for more books when we were finished. For my family, the library was a place to spend the day. It was our commons um, to explore, to find books for, to bring home for reading and discussion. And since it was a public library, something that I would later learn to understand as part of our working class town's intellectual commons, it was all the more kind of um, something where, you know, where we could have a relation, where we could be and belong without necessarily having that be under threat. Although we know, you know, that there aren't a lot of libraries that continue to work in the same way now. So that part of it, right, the archive is commons through things like libraries, through digital commons, through whatever we want to think about, right? To whom does that belong? And does it still exist? Will it continue to exist? I mean, I'm thinking about all these questions as I'm talking and I, I won't go into detail, but what are the claims upon it? And how do we, as, as Roma, as humans, as, um, you know, racialized minorities, as gendered minorities, um, non-humans, BIPOC communities, Romani people, women, non-binary binary people, working class people, people who are undocumented, everyone, right? How do we interact with the commons? Where are these, you know, where are the spaces where we belong? And what claims do we lay upon the commons? Um, and so in that way, I guess I want to talk about the commons, its relationship to the archive and encampment and the possibilities for material, symbolic, cultural and social engagement around publics and commons. But again, that's for another day. I won't talk about that right now. What I'm gonna come back to is the library and archive. So one of my first visits to the Sawyer Library at Williams College, which was my university, I found the section devoted to Romani history to culture and to language. I was amazed to know that there was a part of the library with books about Romani people and culture. And I remember taking dozens of books from the shelves, sitting on the floor and reading, just as I had done throughout my childhood. I was practicing encampment in the library and in what could be considered maybe a university commons, although not public in that way. After spending hours with the books and journals, I assume now that the, one of the journals was the Journal of the Gypsy Lore Society, soon to be renamed Romani Studies. Um, I checked out a dozen or so to bring back to my room. I kept those books with me all semester, bringing them back for Thanksgiving break, so in November, to share with my family. My mother and my aunt and I read the books, and I kept coming back to one question in particular asking them, why don't we do all the things that these books say Romani people do? Why are we doing it wrong? My aunt Tally, upon hearing me ask that, why are we doing it wrong, immediately responded. She retorted, she was not happy. If I don't know how to be a gypsy, I'm not sure who does. Right, if I don't know how to be Romani, I am not sure who does. So me bringing those books home, what I had taken as expertise, right, as evidence from the archive, I was super happy because it was evidence of our existence in an official archive, in the form of the written word, right, that placed a particular culture and history onto my family, onto my people. Well, in that moment, my aunt, through her question, and my mother taught me in turn to question. And my aunt's response has stayed with me since. It's pushed me to rethink knowledge production and expertise and to understand the workings of race, gender, class, and access to cultural capital in the academy. It has stayed with me when I finally came to the work of Ian Hancock, the first tenured Romani professor in the United States. <laughs> Sorry, I am really, ooh, tapada. And it stayed with me as I have navigated the academy as a first generation high school and college graduate, as the first Romani PhD in the United States, and as the first Romani woman tenured professor. After that first discussion with my auntie, we spent that Thanksgiving 
and the subsequent summer breaks from college and my visits from graduate school, reading the books on Roma written by the Gadje specialists, the so-called Romani Rise from George Barrow to the present day. We argued with those books, we discussed them, and we thought together about their means of production. How they circulated, me, um, how they circulated and how they made us feel. The family discussions, the ways we read, and the critiques we put forth were models of what I have come to understand as encampment. We were not part of the archive. Our ancestors, our histories, our cousins. Um, I'm trying to get rid of that phone that keeps calling. I'm sorry, our cousins uh, in other parts of the world were subjected to the archive. But our archive, our archives were outside. They were intergenerational, they were messy, they were gendered, and they were polyvocal. Our archives were outside. The address on the old letters, both to and from, are Reed Street, Somerset, Mass, Massachusetts, or just South Somerset, Massachusetts. In my memory, there's a street number on the letters, but I have just gone to look at them and there's no street number. Just a name and a street and a part of town. One envelope addressed to my grandmother, who was also Ethel, Contained a, contained a condolence letter from someone whom I'd never met, whose name is unknown to me, someone who thought the world of my grandfather. The letter was addressed to Ethel Stanley, South Somerset, Massachusetts. Mass, it said, but Massachusetts. And had been redirected to Cumberland, Maine. The envelope had been crossed out. It crossed out South Somerset and someone wrote the new town, but no street address. But from that letter and from that address, that's my intimate personal archive. I imagine a world. So a person wrote to my grandmother after my grandfather had passed, had died. And since it was fall, my grandmother, along with my mother, Charlotte, and my uncle Coley, must have been at Cumberland Fairgrounds with the horses, taking the horses up north several hours after my grandfather had died. Was my aunt Tally with them or was she with my uncle Leonard paving driveways or selling things from door to door? This letter along with the other letters and photos resting in the old ice box that smells of camphor of mothballs, something else, very pungent, are the beginnings of my family archive. My family patron. They trace my family's whereabouts as they moved between what was called Gypsy Hill in Somerset, Massachusetts, across New England, always with the horses. The letters give addresses and narrate key moments. And the photos provide images of people and locations in the letters. There are more photos and, than letters in the old wooden ice box filled with family memorabilia that I brought from my mother's trailer after she died. The memorabilia include newspaper clippings from my childhood, my diplomas and yearbooks, my father's army discharge papers, and photos of my mother, my father, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, my mother's cousins, grandparents, great-grandparents, and extended family who were, who were alive and probably died before I was, bo I was born. Of course, I've started my own archive of similar photos that continue that with my children, with my nieces and nephews, my cousins, and my extended family. As a child, I would unpack the icebox and go through the photos, often ignoring the newspaper clippings and letters. Even though I could not bear to open the icebox for years after my mother passed, I know the photos. They are as intimate to me as the gravestones in Nathan Slade Cemetery. And if that icebox contains one section of my archive, what also we can talk about or what is also there are the ways in which I 
maintain an idea of the cemetery, the Romani grave, as a form of monumentality or as a, as a monument or maybe an anti-monument. The gravestones at Nathan Slade Cemetery are clustered in the plot where generations of my family are buried, the most recent of which are my mother and my aunt. Many of the individual gravestones on the site have quotes chosen for and sometimes by the people buried there. My mother's epitaph, this is the day that the Lord has made, is what she would say when she awoke every morning, coming from the Bible. She would follow it with, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Certainly a life lesson for all of us. We see this in all of our cemeteries, names, dates, yes, but also sayings, quotes, photos, small remembrances, and hidden codes, such as hedgehogs, niglus, witches, and horseshoes. The stones, the markers, the gifts, and the sayings that are in the cemetery are another patron, a code, a plan, a language, and a shared understanding that marks family, community, and belonging. They as well are at once monument and archive. The gravestones are monuments to the past, their tributes to our ancestors, and they have tiny hints of their personalities, their lives, right, in the forms of these quotes, these epitaphs, the gifts, what's been left behind. When we would go to the cemetery as a family, we would bring a picnic and we would spend time amongst the gravestones, communing with each other and with our ancestors. The girls, my cousins and I, would run around the cemetery, roll down the hill and come back to be with our elders. We would read the gravestones and remember our families. We would picnic with those of us who are still with us and enjoy what I remember as spring sunshine. And after the cemetery, we would visit our family members in the area, in Somerset, Swansea and Fall River. And we would always end up at Gypsy Hill. Gypsy Hill was a piece of land that was part of my family for five generations. It was on Reed Street in South Somerset, Massachusetts. It had been home to our family since the 19th century. My mother was born there, and I think my grandmother too, and her mother as well. I mark my generations in matrilineality. As well, across five or more generations, I said that. During my childhood in the 1970s, our old aunts and uncles lived there. Aunt Sarah and Uncle Billy in one tiny one-room house and Aunt Tootsie in the other. I remember the two houses. Um, they were wooden, they were gray or blue. Um, there was a big expanse of grass and an outdoor water pump. I also remember that um, going there felt like home. It felt like the place of belonging. And any time that my aunts or uncles um, or cousins would go to Fall River, to Somerset, to Gypsy Hill, I could palpably feel that connection through the souvenirs they brought back. Chorizo, um, chorizo, which you know we called Cherise, coffee milk, cohogs, and jelly roll cake. This food, these stopover souvenirs, were connected us to each other and to a history that remained fuzzy the fading dots on the map that connected my town of Rochester to various spots, um, Saco, Fall River, Swansea, Somerset, East Providence, Boston, Salisbury, Tilton, Wells, Orange, Claremont, and the large vague swath of upstate New York, all of which were homes to various parts of our extended Romany family. Even more vague were the connected dots between the United States and Europe, between New England and Virginia, between us and Florida, dots traced by seasonal movements of our cousins up and down the East Coast. At the center of these fading dots, these connections were Fall River and Somerset, and at the very center was Gypsy Hill, a piece of land owned by my extended family for over a century. These sites, groundings, extend for me from Gypsy Hill across the United States, across the Americas, across Europe and beyond, perhaps to India. They mark our places, our sites of belonging and our histories. One of those dots is in Poligono Sur, right here. They point 
to our enduring presence. They point to other gypsy hills, to other sites, stopping places, neighborhoods, to other mahalas, to other homes and to other graves. For generations of my mother's family and for much of my childhood, what was called Gypsy Hill was a nexus. It was a permanent stopping place, a center and a grounding. It was our archive, just as our conversations are being together comprised part of our archive. Like much of Romani existence, like much of our grounding, the center was rendered precarious in the name of statecraft. Through an act of eminent domain, our center was taken away during my childhood. The only thing that continued to hold us together once my family was evicted from the piece of land that they had held on to for generations was our sense of who we were, marked by language and Romani pay, by love, by fading memory, and by the cemetery the center was taken away. So where are our histories? Where are our archives? They don't rest in the nation state. We embody them. We live them. We bring them with us. We bring them through our ancestors. We bring them through our children, through our very existence into the future. We bring them through expulsion and enslavement, we brought them through 1492 um, and the Reconquista, through the Primera Pragmática um, de 1499, and then through the Gran Redada, um, the, through the Great Roundup in 1749. We brought them through the Holocaust. We brought them through the daily experience of eviction of exclusion, of marginalization, and of the denial of our basic rights. We carry our archives with us. Um, I'm still congested. The construction of Europe is dependent upon its Romani history. It's dependent upon the dates that I just listed so quickly. And I think it's crucial that we, we reframe you know, the notion that we are the marginalized ones and really think about the ways in which we've been kind of central to the construction of Europe, precisely through forming ourselves as a, con a constitutive outside, right? That, that we've been sort of framed against and outside of Europe. And yet Europe depends upon our very existence. The making of Europe was predicated upon the consolidation of the nation as a form and yet has really been you know, creating the creating of a bounded Europe um, has really been based upon the creation of refugee camps, of concentration camps, of slave quarters, of slums, and of shanty towns. Romani camps, refugee camps, were central to the Europe's constituent of outside and formed this kind of larger history that to which you know, we've been kind of excluded and denied. And so in this way, right, Romani history itself is a history of the camp. And the project, this larger project is for me a reclaiming and a recounting of the camp through our histories of survival, through our histories of expulsion and through our histories of just being and staying. Through these histories, I'm also recounting our survivals and our resistances and the ways in which those survivals and resistances defy property, statecraft, and the barbarian formation of the state as a human community that has some sort of legitimate monopoly on the control of violence. These histories connect our patrons, our patrons um, across the world, across landscapes of labor, appropriation, and diaspora through the morasses of genocide, of violence, property and erasure, and in the groves and woodlands of remembrance, refusal, survival and resistance. There are cartographies, there are archives, um, there are belonging and our story. They come through the testimony of our people that's embodied, embodied in intergenerational forms of knowledge, embodied in, in work, embodied in flamenco, embodied in practices of encampment outside of the nation state and against the nation state. 
they connect us through centuries, through millennia, through generations. And so Gypsy Hill, as I come back to it, was demolished. And to be honest, dem demolition didn't take that much. Just two small homes and a water pump. Because we live lightly on the land without so much of a trace. No monuments, except the cemetery, no dams, no infrastructure, no carbon footprint. Aunt Sarah, Uncle Billy, and Aunt Tootsie were housed, were rehoused, relocated. None of the terms do justice to the symbolic and existential violence embodied by this practice. They were housed in the public housing that had been built in their place, the place of their homes on Gypsy Hill, now named Eugene Murphy Village. Not named Aunt Sarah Village or Uncle Billy Village, right? Not even Romany Village, but Eugene Murphy Village. Some random gajo who, I don't know how he got his name there, but it's there. In the apartment, Aunt Sarah figured out the uses and dangers of things like the garbage disposal. I remember her talking about how we shouldn't put our fingers in there to retrieve anything that may have fallen in. At the time, I didn't think to ask her how different this kitchen must have been from the old blue water pump that had been outside of her house throughout her life. I have looked back at the old photos of Gypsy Hill taken before I was born. I found photos of my mother on Easter, so beautiful, dressed to the nines, her curly hair like a beautiful dark cloud around her head, standing in front of a convertible. I found another of her from an earlier time perfectly dressed in high heels, standing on the grass in front of a tree with the power lines, lines, lines looming tall behind her. Other photos of other own unknown relatives from the 1940s and the 1950s, showing them cooking outside their trailers. One photo has the two small houses on Gypsy Hill in the background, the ones I remember from my childhood. I've also found birth and death records of grandparents and great grandparents and all the names are there are the same names that are in the Nathan Slade Cemetery. So in that way, my family land, Gypsy Hill, its history and its people are invisible. They've been lost from the archive, except in my hazy memory and in that of my cousins. Invisible, except as colloquial references on census records. There's no plaque, there's no marker, there's no footnote on the census. Our multi-generational home, this piece of land, one of many Gypsy Hills, many Romany roads, one of many places across the world where Romany history is overdetermined in name and invisible in the archive. Romani pay, our shared history, our embodiment, our being, our archive, allows us to disrupt the archives of the dominant, allows us to think through possibilities of belonging beyond the nation, beyond the state, and beyond capital. This opening brings me back to Gypsy Hill in Somerset, in London. It brings me to Shutka. It brings me to Mahalas across Europe. It brings me to El Poligono Sur, to encampments from Bobbin Mill to Dale Farm to Le Samaritain in Paris, to Belleville in Belgrade, to Sulukule in Istanbul, to Mishkols and Gyogonspata, across Europe, across the United States, across the Americas, across the world. We are here. We are united by our histories of survival and resistance, united by the work we do, our language, and our ancestors. So I leave my patrons for those who come after, just as I read the patrons of my ancestors, patrons of survival, of resistance, of encampment, of knowledge, and of connection. The patrons of my ancestors remain with us in the forms of communication to each other, amongst each other, in the glances we exchange, in the recognition one to the other, in the Teaves Bachtale and the Kushti Bach and the Sarsan, which will tree greet each other. Our language, our Romani Chib, our mother tongue and our mother's hands, in our holding onto culture as being onto family, onto Romani pay, and often holding our light and our beauty from the gaje who would steal it. Encampment is decoloniality in practice. It is the basis upon which we can build 
a liberated archive that's for us, for all of us. And they remain just as surely as the encampment, the mahala, the cemetery remain. We remain in the face of threat, genocide, eviction, expulsion, and denial. So let's do this together. Let's make our patrons. Let's make our archives. Let's make our encampments as guides, as safeguards, as home, as knowledge, as method, as love. Thank you so much.